Welcome and please be seated. It's now my great pleasure to welcome all of you, distinguished guests, faculty colleagues, families, friends, and the members of the graduating class to the 2014 commencement exercises of the Yale Law School. We gather today to celebrate a moment of consequence in the lives of 218 JD candidates, 24 LLM candidates, three MSL candidates, and five JSD candidates. And when these 250 individuals finish their academic requirements, <laughs> when the last staple goes through the last paper, when the last examination is at last graded, they will be, quite simply, the finest new law graduates on the planet. All the music, all the marching, all the medieval badges and robes and ceremony that surround us this day are meant to mark this single decisive moment of transition in the lives of these 250 graduates. And as with all moments of transition, it is an occasion both to take stock of the past and to assess the bright but inscrutable future that lies before us. If we gaze backwards into the past, we can see that there is a long and winding pathway that has led to this graduation. Members of the graduating class have had to accomplish a great deal to arrive at this moment. But it is important to stress at the outset that these accomplishments, however heroic, are not those of our graduates alone. Behind each and every one of our graduates is a story of family and friends, of parents who nourished and sacrificed, who hovered and who let go, of grandparents, uncles, and aunts who supported and sustained them, of brothers, sisters, cousins, and friends who stood by them and with them, of partners, spouses, children, and other loved ones who strengthened and inspired them. The real education of our graduates was earned long before they arrived here at the Yale Law School. We are latecomers in their lives, and we have had them in our care only for an instant. So as we call to mind the past that has brought us to this graduation, let us remember first and foremost those who truly made this moment possible. With the families and friends of the class of 2014, many of whom I know have traveled long distances to be here, please rise so we may honor and welcome you. And let us honor also the faculty of this law school who sit before you on this stage. It has been their responsibility to educate you, members of the graduating class, in the intricate ways of the law. On this stage is by common acclamation, the finest and most influential law faculty in the world. They have worked hard to give you a sense of mastery so that the law might feel in your hands intelligible, familiar, and responsive and they have offered you their passion for the law, and in the process, they have forever altered the horizons in which you shall sail forward into your lives. So let us now, while they are all assembled here together, thank them also.
And we might take this moment also to thank those many members of the Yale community who have worked so hard to make your time among us comfortable and secure. They have rescued your computers. They've piloted you through the maze of our remarkable library. They've maintained our gem of a building. They've mailed out your many letters of recommendation. They've responded to your requests for room reservations in all caps. <laughs> and they've performed a myriad of other services of which you might or might not be aware. I want to give special thanks today to Associate Dean Kathleen Overly, who has spent who has spent night and day tending to the many needs of our students, and to Associate Dean Megan Barnett, whose talented and tireless enterprise has benefited all of you in the graduating class. To Associate Dean Asha Rangappa, who has handled the requirements of your financial aid with tact and assurance, and to our librarian, Blair Kaufman, who has, if it's possible, catapulted the services of your library into even new heights. To Assistant Dean Gordon Silverstein, whose tender care for the graduate students has been unrelenting. And to our devoted and patient registrar, Assistant Dean Judith Calvert, who has organized this day and who works harder than any of you can imagine to make sure that your requirements are fulfilled so that, in fact, you will be able to graduate. And finally, to Associate Dean Mike Thompson, whose inventiveness and attentiveness and sympathy for every, again, every concern, large and small, keeps this complex place running smoothly. So, moments of transition like this hang suspended between the past and the, and the future. They are comforting because they're familiar. They culminate all that has gone before, but they are also bittersweet because something must end in order for some change to take hold. In every ending is the challenge of a new beginning. And moments like this are therefore charged, in part with the excitement of new creation, but also in part with the vague disquiet of the unknown. Members of the graduating class, your future is without doubt bright. You are now equipped with one of the great degrees in legal education anywhere in the world. You have acquired magnificent friends and astonishing peers. You have been trained by masters, and you have earned the support of a school that will stand by you throughout your career. And yet, of course, in the nature of things, the future is uncertain, and that is a cause for anxiety. And I can't help but think that your class has had more than its fair share of anxiety while at this law school. It was during your second year, for example, that the once orderly clerkship market collapsed, spraying uncertainty and insecurity and confusion in every direction. And when you leave here, you will also face more than your fair share of challenges. Our civic life seems to have dissolved into acrimony and accusation. Our international order, so painstakingly constructed after the Second World War, is unraveling before our eyes. We must face down the consequences of the bloodlands of the Ukraine, the shattered landscapes of Syria, the endless sands of terrorism, the violent storms of a hot and angry planet. On this day of your graduation, therefore, I cannot but wonder how you will make your way in this new and potentially unfriendly world. In what will you trust? What will be your strength? And where will you look for guidance? And I have, in this regard, some very 
very modest advice for you. My generation has bequeathed to you a world so crushingly complex, so systematically interdependent as to seem impervious to human intervention. It is easy in such a world to begin to care only about the small things which we imagine we can control, a good clerkship, a high salary, a prestigious law firm. And of course, these things do matter. But in the long run, unless you know where you are going, they do not add up to a life. So I have a modest suggestion about how to find your way through the unpredictable world that awaits you after this graduation. You must make a wish. The great German literary critic, Walter Benjamin, writing in 1939 about the poetry of Baudelaire, once contrasted two different ways of experiencing time. The first is the way that a gambler experiences time. For the gambler, time is divided into discrete segments. The next card, the next race, the next job, the next clerkship, the next government position, the next partnership. The gambler strives to predict and to control these things. He thinks he is being strategic and calculating. But in fact, each time the gambler rolls the dice, he starts anew. The second way to experience time is over the long durée. And Benjamin writes that the way to enter this kind of time is to make a wish. And that is true because every wish contains within it a narrative, a story that will lend an overarching integration to your life. A wish, Benjamin writes, is a kind of experience. If it is the right kind of wish, if it is a wish for something as distant and as unobtainable, say, as a shooting star, then a wish can accomplish something truly remarkable. It can fuse together the scattered fragments of your life into a coherent and extended temporal arc. It can infuse the entirety of your life with integrity and purpose. And Benjamin's point is that this kind of a wish, call it a true wish or a utopian wish, can change the way that you experience your life. This same point was stressed in 1924 by the German poet Rainer Maria Wilke. He wrote this, he said, my eyes already touch the sunny hill going far ahead of the road I have begun. So we are grasped by what we cannot grasp. It has its inner light, even from a distance, and changes us, even if we do not reach it into something else, which, hardly sensing it, we already are. In these lines, Rilke is telling us that your wishes may or may not be fulfilled, but if you find something worthwhile to wish for, and if you pursue that wish, it will change you into something else, something which potentially you may already be. Your wish will grasp you even if you do not grasp it, and you will become the kind of person who lives in the light of your wish. So my modest suggestion is that you make such a wish. Search for the sunny hill in the far distance, live in the light of that wish, and it will help protect you against the anxieties that now seem to you so pressing. As far as I can tell, the writer who coined the phrase, the age of anxiety, was W.H. Auden in 1947. And Auden, who was much influenced by Rilke, believed that anxiety in the modern world stems in part from our inability to imagine a distant future. And instead, we lie trapped, like the gambler, in what Auden calls the presence an open sorrow whose limits are what we are. We are trapped in the present, like the gambler, and when we are trapped in the present, like the gambler, we have no effective defense against the anxieties associated with chance and hopelessness, drift, isolation, panic, and carelessness. 
We cannot look to the imagined future for solace and for strength. We are easily thrown off course. We despair. We are overwhelmed. No matter what we accomplish, we cannot seem to find fulfillment. But the question is, why are we trapped in this oppressive present? Auden writes that it is because we have what he calls an error bred in the bone. He suggests that our failure to imagine a future occurs when, to quote him, each woman and each man craves what it cannot have, not universal love, but to be loved alone. That is a profound thought. Some of our greatest leaders may indeed crave to be loved alone. They may yearn for the kind of electric charisma that eclipses everyone around them. And because this seems glamorous, you may also wish to shine in that way. But don't be fooled. That kind of charisma is fundamentally inhuman. The need to be loved alone is a seductive, misleading desire, a desire that is the opposite of a true wish. And that is because every true wish contains within it the seeds of an imagined future. And there is almost no future worth building that you can build alone. Our future must be built together. No one exists alone, Auden writes. We must love one another or die. So, if a wish is to give your life resilience and strength, you must imagine a future in which you join with others to construct your dream. That is to say, every true wish contains within it a vision of community, an ideal of politics, an image of a shining city on a distant sunny hill. No matter how complex or impervious the world may appear to you, you must find a way to imagine it to imagine how you can refashion it, how you can make it responsive to your own true wish. And law is what makes such vision possible. And that is because law is the background condition for every social enterprise. That is why, in a famous poem, Auden oddly compares the law to love. It is a witty and an amusing poem, and I recommend you read it. And in it, Auden considers, one by one, all the standard jurisprudential definitions of law, and he rejects each of them. He says, law is not the wisdom of the old, it is not the will of God, it is not the pronouncements of judges, it is not the loud, angry crowd. Auden takes particular aim at the jurisprudential definition favored by professors who are legal realists. He writes, he says this, he says, yet law-abiding scholars write, law is neither wrong nor right, law is only crimes punished by places and by times. Law is the clothes men wear any time, anywhere. Law is good morning and good night. Auden rejects that definition of law. And instead, he affirms very strangely and very tentatively that law is like love. He writes, like love, we don't know where or why. Like love, we can't compel or fly. Like love, we often weep. Like love, we seldom keep. These are difficult lines, but I read them to mean that for all its vagaries and betrayals, love is an essential and inescapable dimension of human life. One can't be human without love. And law, like love, is also an essential and inescapable dimension of human life. Without law, we cannot establish a common endeavor or build a common future. Without law, we cannot imagine a better community, and so we cannot escape the prison of the present. We may weep for the injustice of the law, and we may violate the law, but we cannot fly from the law without simultaneously flying from the best parts of ourselves. To lose faith in the possibility of law, therefore, is to betray our humanity. Without law, as without love, there can be no society worth wishing for on a distant star. And without that star, 
Without that wish, you will be lost in the fragmented time of the gambler. You will be thrown back on yourself and you will experience life as one damn card after another, one damn job after another. Your teachers and friends on this platform hope that during your time among us, we have taught you something about how to use the law to achieve your own true wish. We hope we have initiated you into the practices of effective governance and illuminated for you the inner workings of institutions, the mysteries of incentives, the murky language of social values. And we hope we have also given you an understanding of the rule of law, which is one of civilization's great achievements. We hope you will remember that when law is severed from competence, it cannot long survive. But when that law is indifferent to justice, it becomes an abomination. We hope that we have taught you that law is not merely a means of social coordination, but like love, law is indispensable for human flourishing. So my wish for you on this auspicious day is that you leave here with your own true wish, one that will give purpose and shape to your life. My hope is that you will have the competence and confidence to pursue that wish and that the pursuit will give you always a reason to look up from your books, from your career, from your life, and to ask why things can or should be different and better. My hope is that fidelity to your wish may help deflect the anxieties that will inevitably afflict you. And my hope is that, as my great predecessor, as Dean Harold Coe used to say, you will not die with your options open. <laughs> when you leave here, you will become leaders in your chosen fields. And you will no doubt, no doubt, face insoluble problems. But it is the wish of all your teachers here on this stage that you may encounter the unimaginable adventures that lie before you with the same verve and intelligence, with the same unfailing self-respect, with the same moral courage, with the same pleasure and delight that you have displayed during your time here among us. We place our faith in you to construct a new future for all of us. I cannot express how excited we all are to watch you from afar. Your success is our wish, and we want you to come back and see us, and when you do, bring stories. But for now, on behalf of this faculty and this community, and the proud profession of which you shall soon be a part, congratulations. We presently have three graduate degree programs at Yale Law Schools. The, study, the students in these programs have already been trained as professionals, and they have come to us seeking to engage in the advanced study of law. This year, five students will receive the high degree of Doctor of the Science of Law, the JSD degree. These are students who have previously received an LLM degree at Yale Law School, and who have maintained their course of study in order to compose a rigorous dissertation which constitutes a substantial contribution to legal scholarship. This year, 24 students will receive the degree of Master of Laws, the LLM degree. Each of these students has studied here during the past year, taking courses and working closely with faculty members in order to meet the strenuous requirements of this advanced degree. And finally, in the class of 2014, we have three students who will receive a Master of Studies in Law degree, the MSL. These students are professionals who are not lawyers and who during the past year have explored the relationship between law and another discipline. To present the candidates for these advanced degrees in law, I call upon their advocate, friend, and mentor, Assistant Dean Gordon Silverstein.
Dean Post, members of the faculty, distinguished guests, it's my high privilege and distinct honor to present to you to the candidates for these advanced degrees. For the degree of Doctor of the Science of Law, G. Eric Brunstad, Jr. <laughs> Ofer Eldar. <laughs> Jose Sebastian Elias. James Edward Folks. Mikhail, Michaela Heilbronner. Heejin Kim. <laughs> Itamar J. Memkanovitz. <laughs> Ji Young Min. <laughs> Zi Kang Huang. Tian Yan, and for the degree of Master of Laws, Ashwita Ambast, Gautiam Bhatia, Ferdinando Cesar Lunar J. Filo. Elena Chima. <laughs> Roberto Quinasco. <laughs> Roma Francois Marc D'Ambra. <laughs> Tara Maria Davenport. Tasneem Javindra Dav. <laughs> Camilo Di Donato. <laughs> Yorios Vimotropoulos. <laughs> Philip Nicolet Hacker. Yue Huang. <laughs> Jin Jin Liu. <laughs> Yun Yang Min. <laughs> Katrine Rita Jo Morbe. Yitzhak Pasha. Guillarme Hesina Costa. Chanakia Arjun Seti. Omer Schatz. Shlomit Stein, Chris Tamale, Brian Dennis Tiahanko, Els Renilda Josephine Van de Zandt. Ying Zhu. And for the degree of Master of Studies in Law, Jessica Eden Medina.
Ilyana Ivanova Petkova. Adina El Roskies and Micah. In the class of 2014, 218 students will receive the degree of Juris Doctor, the JD degree. To earn this degree, students have had to complete three years of difficult coursework, as well as to undertake substantial and sustained analytic writing under faculty supervision. To present the candidates for this degree, I now call upon our Associate Dean of Student Affairs, Kathleen Overly, who has served our students with compassion and with wisdom. Dean Post, members of the faculty and administration, graduates and honored guests, it's a privilege to present the candidates for the degree of Juris Doctor. Marjan Fuzgar. Tian Gai. Fiona Lavinia Heckscher. Robert Douglas James. Daniel Coleman Simon. Daniel Richard Weisfield. <laughs> Zoe E. <laughs> Megdi Ali Maher Abdullah. Sparky Abraham. <laughs> Justin Paul Akmando. <laughs> Emily Ann Alden and her daughter Leah Emily Alden. Matthew Stewart Andrews. <laughs> Joseph Tebohol and Sorga. <laughs> Aida Fasil Araya Lebromskin. <laughs> Casey Ann Arnold. <laughs> Jessica Ann Asra. <laughs> Luckman Shagun Aziz. <laughs> Todd Benjamin Baker. Caitlin Fitzgerald Bellis. Shavik Bhattacharya. A. Z. Biazar.
Lauren Francis Bixaki. Lisa Wong Bull. Daniel Franklin Bousquet. Julia Higgins Brower. <laughs> Emily Montgomery Brown with her children Leo and Jacqueline. Piat Cheslav Brzezinski. Rebecca Pilar McWalter Poza. Christian Rousseau Berset. Andrew David Burt. Angela Kai. Benjamin Garrett Kane. Kelly Nelson Carson. Sarah Marie Caruana. Union Angela Cho. Jonathan Hufong Choi. Jane Yumi Chong. Pratik Chagule. Hyun Kyo Chang. Paul Joseph Connell. Douglas Henry Cunningham. Sue Da. Grant Michael Damon. Elizabeth Brody David. James Texas Dawson. Ravi Didwania. Kyle Johnson Delbert. Laura Delavedova. Matthew Robert Devlin. Daniel Patrick Driscoll. Jamie Brett Edwards. Benjamin Idelson.
Amanda Eldacacne. Aditi Srividya Elaswarapu. Hallie Wilder Epstein. Bridget Anna Fahey. Benjamin Frankel Farkas. Adele Four. David Russell Felton. Laura Femino. Micah Festa Ferguson. Jeanette Ashley Fig. <laughs> Carlton Elliott Forbes. <laughs> Yun Bernard Fogner. Margaret Orr Fox. Deborah Francois. Rachel Lauren Freed. Daniel Butler Friedman. <laughs> Kellen Richard Funk with his daughter Penelope Funk. <laughs> Peter Anthony Gabrielli. Christopher James Francis Galliardo. <laughs> Emily Ariel Garrick. <laughs> Catherine Leah Gibson. Sydney Adam Goldenberg. <laughs> Michelle Gabrielle Golubek Goldman. <laughs> Gloria Jean Gong with her children, Maria Jean Brinton Gong and Sarah Ellie Brenton Gong. <laughs> Abigail Alice Graber. Mindy Lou Green. Jonathan Greenstein.
Sarah Lynn Grusen. Andrew Stephen Hammond. Joshua Keith Handel. Alexandra Reed Harrington. Lauren Jean Hartz. Charles Lawrence Houck. Patrick John Hayden. Alex Campbell Hemmer. Guiana Enriquez. Aaron Dane Henson. Zachary Robert Hurst. Kendall Allison Higgs. Christopher George Hollins. Andrew Gregory Hoskinson. Sinead Nora Hunt. Laura Regina Johns. Jeffrey Kane. Chelsea Teresa Kelly. Baber Joffer Quaja. Ji Young Kim. <laughs> Stephanie Haywon Kim. <laughs> Stephen John Cochever. Zima Cola. <laughs> Christina Mary Conagisor. <laughs> Harrison Allen Corn. Elise Kraft. Christopher David Lebowski. Sarah Rose Langberg. John Thomas Langford.
Matthew Joseph Letton. Alicia Marie Levijou. Jamie Reve Lewis. John Talton Lewis. Jimmy Lee. Sheng Tao Lee. Cynthia Liao. Sue Lin. Aaron Michael Littman. David Scott Lauk. Alexandra Mutung Lu. Michelle Lu. Richard Brandt Ludeman. Alexa Blaine Lutchen. Edward Webb Lyons. Tianmu Ma. Thomas Joseph Maher. Elizabeth Marie Mack. Roger Daniel Maldonado. Mark Anthony Monfra. Amanda Roman Mangaser. <laughs> Jessica Ann Marsden. <laughs> Jessica Ann Martinez. Daniel Ryan McCartney. Yeah. Megan Suzanne McCormick. Joshua Ivan McLaurin. Ia Megre. <laughs> Matthew Daniel Melama. <laughs> Lev Menand.
Samson Zabena Masella. Alexander John Friesen Metz. Matthew Stewart Mishkin. Kathleen Ellen Mollison. Henry Edward Moon. Anjali Mopke. Michael Andreas Nance. Christopher Daniel Mason. Andrea Christina Mill Sanchez. Rina Emiko O'Leary. Chika Okafor. Samuel Gill Oliver Friedland. <laughs> Temi Dio Falose Olapade. <laughs> Christina Nicole Hakudin. Aditi Padmanabhan. Travis Luis Pantin. Celso Perez. Stephen John Petrani. Michael Leo Pomerantz. Jillian Ferguson Quant. Robert Jacob Quigley. <laughs> Ravi Ramanathan. <laughs> Sheila Ramesh. Ranjana Reddy. <laughs> Jessica Aaron Reich. <laughs> Tara L. Rhodes. <laughs> Celia Clary Rhodes. Nathan James Robinson. <laughs> Emily Beth Rock. <laughs> Kristen Tav Romero. Tyler Thomas Rosenbaum.
Matthew Jacob Rubenstein. Chase Stephen Sackett. Robbie Lee Ray Saldana. Sarat Sangha. Eli Banks Shankar. Gabriel Alexander Scheffler. Vivian Kim Scott. Christina Marie Seda. Stephen Michael Siegel. Rachel Gabriella Shalev. Elisa Schechtman. Michael She. Joshua Maxwell Silverstein. Zachary Simmons. Jennifer Louise Skeen. William Allen Smiley. Asher Ellison Smith. Bryson Campbell Smith. John James Snydo. Jessica Tienman So. Elizabeth Song. Michael Caleb Soto. Joshua Michelangelo Stein. Sonia Ann Steinway with her son, Raphael. Andrew Douglas Sternlein. Ariel Jerome Stevenson. John Randolph Stokes, Jr. Wanling Su. Nafis Asiya Sayed.
J. Benjamin Sykes. Haran Tay. Tiffany Ng Tam. <laughs> Michael Paul Taunton. <laughs> Tina Marie Thomas. Ryan Richard Thorson. Karun Talak. Adam Ross Taborowski. Maria Laura Torre Gomez. <laughs> Canel Truyo. <laughs> Caitlin, Caitlin Bennett Tully. Elena Evelyn Vargalucas. <laughs> Irina Lenny Venerman. <laughs> Vidya Venkiraman. Jacob Moshe Victor. <laughs> Constance Lynn Vogelman. <laughs> Xiao Wang. <laughs> Ryan Nicholas Watzel. Adrian Anna Wadgen. <laughs> Joshua Solomon Wanger. <laughs> Alexander Mandela Watley. Rachel Garland Wiener. Bryn Anderson Williams. Rebecca Elizabeth Wolitz. Mary Catherine Yannick. <laughs> Bernice Bai Yu. <laughs> Leah Stoman Zamor. <laughs> Laura Christina Zaragoza. Ian Zhao.
Benjamin Samuel Zwiefak. Congratulations, class of 2014. Each year, the graduating class elects a member of the faculty to speak at their commencement. And this year, they have wisely chosen Munir Ahmad, clinical professor of law and co-director of the Worker and Immigrants' Rights Advocacy Clinic and the Transnational Development Clinic. When Munir joined the Yale Law School a mere five years ago, then acting Dean Kate Stith described him as an extraordinary teacher, a wise and talented lawyer, and a formidable young scholar. And in this, as in all things, Kate was absolutely correct. Munir received his BA and his JD degrees from Harvard, served as a law clerk to William Sessions uh, in the United States District Court in Burlington, Vermont, and he then received a very prestigious Skadden Fellowship to work as a staff attorney at the Asian Pacific American Legal Center in Los Angeles. And in that position, Munir represented low-wage Latino and Asian garment workers. He counseled immigrants who had been trafficked into the United States, and he addressed the impact of welfare reform on immigrant communities. He carried these experiences with him as he began his scholarship, which examines the intersections of immigration, race, and citizenship in both legal theory and legal practice. If there is a single theme in Munir's work, it is the representation of vulnerable communities. Munir has helped our students to represent manufacturing workers here in New Haven, who have lost their jobs due to international competition and were owed federal benefits, as well as street vendors in Bombay. He has investigated cholera outbreaks in Haiti and land reform in Burma. And throughout it all, his luminous intelligence, his professional skill, and his dedication to his clients have remained a pole star for our students. Consider, for example, these remarks by one student who described an early and atypical encounter with Munir. It was my first time in immigration court and we had just found out that our client would not be deported and would be released from detention. I was staring at the immigration judge, still a bit shocked it was all over, and Munir tapped my shoulder and pointed to a screen where our client's image was being projected from the detention center where she was held. Our client was weeping with joy and relief. And I looked over at Munir, and he was crying too. And suddenly, so was I. After many more years of experience than I had, Munir was still affected by our client's emotion. I don't think Munir will ever become jaded. And just as he did at that moment for me, I think he'll always be able to draw a student's attention to what really matters, our clients. Munir Ahmad represents the best of Yale Law School. Passion, skill, dedication, generosity of spirit, and an ongoing determination to fuse law and justice. It gives me immense delight to introduce this year's commencement speaker, Professor Munir Ahmad. Graduates, it is a tremendous pleasure to join you, your family and friends, and all of your loved ones today. In this season of controversial commencement speakers, I'm just glad not to have been disinvited. <laughs> Though I see that Dean Post has a stage hook at the ready in case I go off the rails. This is, of course, a day of celebration. 
I want to invite you to make it a day of reflection as well. And this is a moment to consider not just what you have accomplished as students, scholars, and practitioners, but who you have become as people and how you can best deploy your abundant talents in a world of overwhelming, even unbearable need. Amidst all the speeches and fanfare, the most important voice for you to hear today is your own. Graduation can feel like an anointment, especially from a place like Yale Law School. As if only now, with the donning of your robes and the conferral of your degrees, have you become something. But each of you was already something when you walked into the Yale Law School. Fully formed individuals, people deeply engaged in the world, in the world of ideas, with a sense of self, of place, a mode of thinking, and ways of understanding the complexity of human experience. Our hope for you has been that you would deepen those engagements through immersion in law. For many of you, probably most of you, you have succeeded wildly in this endeavor. But for some of you, I suspect the law school may also have been a place where you lost touch with that sense of self as you were exposed to or indoctrinated by law's methods, operating assumptions, and methodologies, what we benignly call the process of thinking like a lawyer. You may also have felt like your world narrowed and that your fully formed self was reduced to the dimensions of law. I want to invite you to reacquaint yourselves with your earlier selves, the people you were before you came to law school. And I want to suggest that while law school undoubtedly has changed you, socialized you into a profession, and rendered you all temporarily a uniform sea of black robes and mortarboards, this is a moment to listen to your individual voice, express your unique self, and make your own happiness. The story of who you are and of the life you live now includes your law school experience, but is not limited to it. To chart your own life path, you need to tell your own story and do so in your own vernacular. As you do this, you undoubtedly will encounter moments that defy easy comprehension. Through much of your time in law school, we've taught you how to answer difficult questions. By implication, not having a ready answer can feel like failure. However, I want to disabuse you of that notion and talk today about the productivity of the inarticulate moment. I'm delighted to speak to you today as a new parent. My partner and I had a son, Zane, on February 3rd. And because I was on leave, I have missed your last semester of law school. For this reason, I'm especially glad to join you today. To all the parents here today, I can only imagine how proud you must feel. I feel proud every time my son burps, but your daughters and sons have accomplished something even more impressive. <laughs> Parenthood has put me into a contemplative, if somewhat sleep-deprived mood. I suspect many of you found yourselves in a similar state this morning, though perhaps for different reasons. <laughs> Staring at our son's face in the middle of the night, doing my best to remain in that moment of sublime stupor, I can't help but wonder who he will grow up to be. I hope that he has the fine character, the discernment, and the deep compassion that I've seen in my students. I worry about the world he will grow up in. And I'm overwhelmed by the privilege into which he has been born. A loving family with the means to raise and educate him, outstanding medical care, abundant food in a free society. When Zane was born, Guido offered him a clerkship in his chambers. <laughs> Further evidence of the breakdown of the clerkship hiring plan. Zane wasn't sure he wanted to clerk, but he accepted. Knock on wood, his life, like yours, will be rich with opportunity. And yet, I'm mindful of my family's generational proximity to less fortunate circumstances. I remember being in college and talking to my mother about a study I had read showing that girls in Bangladesh received fewer calories per meal than boys did. This was a shocking discovery for me, but my mother didn't need an academic paper to tell her this. When she was growing up in Pakistan, her father and brothers always ate first, and she her mother and sisters ate whatever was left after clearing the dishes. Of course we got fewer calories, she told me somewhat impatiently. Gender-based hunger was not some abstract sociological phenomenon. It was a lived experience 
whose pangs echoed in my own household, even though I had not previously heard them. There's an expression in Urdu, my parents' first language, which was directed to me, directed at me a lot when I was a kid. Apka javab nahi. It translates literally as, there is no answer to you. Though depending on context, it can be either complimentary, as in, there's no topping you, or derisive, as in, you have an answer for everything. It was the derisive meaning that was usually intended for me. When I learned of my mother's childhood experience of routine hunger, I had no answer. It was a profoundly inarticulate moment. For decades now, I've meditated on that moment, seeking to make it intelligible. In many ways, it has animated the choices I've made to work in the fields of civil rights, human rights, and development. I'm still searching for the right language. But I've come to realize that the uncomprehending moment can be even more powerful than the moment of comprehension. And so let me shift from my story to yours. In preparation for my comments today, I asked the graduating class to think back to their reasons for coming to law school. Here are excerpts of some of the responses I received. One of you said, I came to law school because I had felt and witnessed injustice, and I wanted to do something about it, including addressing injustice and how the law meets out justice and injustice. Another wrote, I came to law school because I felt powerless, and I believed that a law degree would give me at least a basic tool set to know where to begin to provide people with some useful help. I came to law school to be an advocate for children and hoped law school would help me figure out if being a lawyer is what I really wanted to do. One of you wrote, I came to law school to get a grounding in law to better understand the practical limitations and possibilities of human rights from a lawyer's perspective and to hopefully be a more effective scholar and advocate as a result. And another, I wanted to become a lawyer or law professor. My main aspiration was to earn a living doing work that I enjoy. One can hear in these statements a clear-eyed optimism, a pragmatic sense of the possibilities for self-improvement and bettering the world, and a hope that law would be a powerful tool to bring such changes about. In your hands, law would change the world, but does the law also change you? I'm guessing that at some point since you arrived at the law school, a non-lawyer friend or family member has said to you, you're speaking like a lawyer. And I'm quite certain that it was not meant as a compliment. Instead, it reflected a change in your vocabulary, diction, and speaking style, and ultimately, your thinking. It was an accusation that you had become formalistic and argumentative. I remember the anxiety that such an accusation produced in me. Perhaps some of you have felt a similar anxiety. Language changes us. It's not just an instrument for communication, but a mode of self-expression. And as such, it helps to constitute the self as well. How we understand ourselves and the world and how we describe them is difficult to say where language ends and the self begins. And so law's language can feel like a displacement of the authentic self. But once you recognize that law is just one of several languages you speak, then you can accept it as a multiplying force in your understanding of the world rather than a totalizing one. Law becomes a facet of your identity and not its entirety. In the past three years, we have taught you how to translate problems in the world into claims in the law. We have pressed you to articulate your arguments clearly and concisely, to stake and defend your positions, to think quickly on your feet. We've privileged the incisively framed question and the crisply delivered response. From the classroom to the dining room, from moot court to immigration court, to superior court in New Haven, the Supreme Court in Hartford, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in New York, and even the US Supreme Court, you have mastered these essential skills of intellectual engagement, persuasion, and lawyering. This is the best of what it means to speak like a lawyer. Now, with these core competencies under your belts, I want to encourage you to push beyond the space of ready articulation. Each of you is immensely talented, and your talents are most needed on the problems we don't yet comprehend. 
the ones that resist easy articulation, the ones we might not yet have the language to describe. You are poised not merely to apply the language of law to a complex world, but to develop new vocabularies and grammars so as to constitute new worlds beyond our current horizons at the limits of our imagination. To do this, I encourage you to embrace the inarticulate moment. Several years ago, my students, a colleague and I, represented a young man detained at Guantanamo. He was 15 years old at the time he was taken into US custody, 16 when he was transferred to Guantanamo, and 18 when I first met him. After years of imprisonment, my colleague and I were the first people to come to see him for a reason other than interrogation. One day, about a year into our, our representation of him, I was at Guantanamo to visit him. I drove through the checkpoints to Camp Delta, passed through security, and sat in a cinder block room to wait for him to arrive. And then I was told he didn't want to see me. And I was stunned. I was his lawyer, his advocate, his partisan. And so I wrote him a note, sent it to him, and waited. Still he refused. I tried once more, again without success. And so I left, returned to my room, and wondered how I would pass the day at Guantanamo Bay now that my client had refused to see me. Confounded by my client's decision and with nothing else to do, I went to the military PX, a general store on the base, bought a pair of running shoes, put on my iPod, and went for a run. As he sat in solitary confinement a few miles away, I jogged the perimeter of the Guantanamo golf course while listening to you too and tried to wrap my mind around what had just happened. Once more, I was at the limits of language, an inarticulate moment. It would take many months, maybe even years, before I gained a full understanding of what had happened. I had assumed that in the legal black hole of Guantanamo, my client would be grateful for a lawyer. But my client had effectively flipped that assumption, as if to say, what good is a lawyer in a legal black hole? Our lawyers help or hindrance in a system that defies legal order. These are difficult and important questions that continue to bedevil lawyers and clients at Guantanamo to this day. But it was only by embracing the inarticulate moment that the questions could even be framed. Part of the reason I am so confident in your ability to work at the limits of language is that I have already seen you do it. You have done remarkable, transformative work during your time here. You have freed people from jail and stopped their deportations. You have influenced the direction of law and policy from the local to international levels. You have changed people's lives, altered institutional structures, and appreciated the inextricable links between the two. You have generated new theoretical insights and produced novel legal scholarship. And you have found in one another serious, thoughtful, and respectful interlocutors with whom you have been willing to push the limits of your own understandings. As one of you wrote to me about your experience working on a journal, what I found really affirming about the journal was the seriousness with which students talk to each other, re-examined their processes, and made an effort to understand what was going wrong and how it could be fixed. It seems small, but I had more deep conversations about what kinds of diversity mattered and why. Structural racism, sexism, and classism, and tacit assumptions about meritocracy and privilege than I did in any of my other activities or courses at YLS. So once we encounter the inarticulate moment, how do we deal with it? One approach lies in what Judith Butler has termed the performative contradiction a pairing of seemingly oppositional terms in order to envision new understandings of the universal. Think, for example, of the claim of dreamers, that they are undocumented citizens, the notion that the very population categorically excluded from citizenship, in fact, has a claim to citizenship. Two, days ago, two decades ago, gay marriage might have been considered a performative contradiction as well. The pioneering of new language is a form of contestation and can help us to anticipate new and more inclusive realities. 
and so we can move from the inarticulate moment to an articulate one. When the inarticulate moment presents, we might also consider what it means not to think like a lawyer or speak like a lawyer, but to listen like the lawyer you have been trained to be. Listening to and developing deep trust relationships with your clients, appreciating context, hearing the call of theory and the echoes of history before attempting to render the moment in language. Because language is only ever approximate, because it attempts to capture human experience but is forever inadequate to the task, because language and the human condition are bound up in one another, we are forever in need of new vocabularies. My hope is that by learning law's language and developing a sophisticated ear, you have learned how to develop new languages of your own. The limits of language are merely frontiers. In closing, I want to encourage you to continue developing your life stories and confronting the inarticulate moments that will arise with the friends you have made here. As one of you wrote, reflecting on your most meaningful experiences at the law school, the moments that stand out are the times when I felt the sense of the amazing community that we have here. I remember the congratulatory emails after my first time speaking in a big lecture class or how the most unexpected people remembered and inquired after I gave an oral argument for clinic. And of course, the genuine excitement I feel when one of my classmates does something amazing. The periodic reminders that we were all in this together elevated the entire law school experience. It became joyful. As another student wrote, my hope as I leave here is that I'll never assume that deep reflection and meaningful action are mutually exclusive, and that I'll always remember how profoundly each can fertilize and enrich the other. And one more student reflection. I hope to make a positive difference in the world without losing a sensibility of optimism about human nature, open-mindedness, or creativity. I also hope I will find a quality of thought and friendship like the one I've enjoyed here where I live, where I work, and where I struggle with my future challenges. I hope success as a lawyer will go hand in hand with my self-realization as a full and fulfilled human being. These are my hopes for you too. And finally, as my mom would say, Apka Javab Nahi, there is no answer to you. And I mean that in the good way. Congratulations. It's our custom at graduation to welcome a speaker who has this day been awarded an honorary doctorate in law from Yale University. And today it is my distinct privilege to welcome a tireless advocate for human rights throughout the world, Professor Michael Posner. Professor Posner was born in Chicago just a few short years after many of his relatives had been victimized by the Holocaust. And from his own family history, he learned that governments in the hands of dictators can perform unspeakable acts. And he also learned that sometimes people must stand up to assert their own rights. And for the last 40 years, Michael Posner has never sat down. In 1972, he earned a BA at the University of Michigan, and in 1975, a JD from Berkeley. As part of his studies, he worked for the International Commission of Jurists in Geneva, interviewing Ugandans who had suffered abuses under the reign of Idi Amin. His work won him esteem as a human rights advocate, and in 1978, he was recruited to become the first full-time director of the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights. 
and within weeks he was testifying before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in support of a bill to impose trade sanction on Amin's regime. The bill passed and Idi Amin was ousted by the Ugandan people within one year. The Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights has since changed its name into Human Rights First and under Michael's leadership it has grown from a staff of two with a few volunteers and a budget of $55,000 to a staff of 100 and a budget in the millions. We have Human Rights First to thank for some of our most important human rights legislation. Michael proposed and campaigned for the Refugee Act of 1980, America's first political asylum law, and he drafted the Torture Victim and Protection Act, which opened the doors of our courts to anyone seeking redress for an act of torture by a government official. Few have so deftly harnessed our democratic processes for the global good. In July of 2009, President Obama announced his intention to nominate Michael to serve as Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. He was confirmed and named to the position in September, which is blistering speed for contemporary congressional action. And as soon as his confirmation was complete, he was on a plane to lead the first ever U.S. delegation to the U.N. Human Rights Council. Over the next four years, Michael instilled a culture of openness and innovation in American human rights and foreign policy. As a key participant in over a dozen international strategic dialogues, he thought he brought much needed candor about our nation's own shortcomings. As he has said, a mature relationship does not mean just raising the other guy's problems, but also raising our own. Michael's advocacy has been visionary, effective, unfaltering and marked by the broadest compassion. He sees human rights not as a discrete issue, but as one inexorably linked to political rights, to economic freedoms, and to national security. He has brought to light, to light rights violations from Ireland to the Philippines, and promoted humane labor policies in everything from footwear to oil extraction. And throughout that, somehow, he has also managed to find time to teach. He lectured at this law school from 1981 to 1984, and again in, in 2009. He lectured at the Columbia Law School from 1984 to 2008. And in 2013, he was named a professor of business and society at the NYU Stern School of Business, where he is launching the first ever center on business and human rights. Professor Posner, you inspire us with your imagination and your drive and the humanity that is reflected in all your work for our country and for the world. You are an advocate in the broadest and truest possible sense. Welcome back to Yale. Thank you, Robert. And first of all, good afternoon and congratulations. I see from the program that I am standing between you and Champagne, so I am going to be very pithy and, and brief. I first want to mention uh, my time here. I was barely out of law school when I was asked by Michael Reisman and Drew Days uh, to come up here and teach a seminar on human rights and help set up the Lowenstein Clinic. Um, they really took a chance on me, and I loved every minute of it. I met some of the most talented, creative, uh, public-spirited people I've ever met anywhere, people just like you. And many of my students, decades later, are now friends and colleagues. But by far, the most uh, important and greatest achievement I made here at Yale was to team up with Drew Days to cajole, to persuade Harold Coe to add human rights to his already full teaching load. Uh, the rest is history. Yale is second to none when it comes to human rights with Harold in the lead. I really want to say, I want to speak to three points very quickly. Uh, first is, as you look out in the world, you have every reason to feel both discouraged about some of the things you see 
and skeptical that you can do much about it. I want to say, though, you can make a difference. And from my vantage point, this is one of the few things that is absolutely crystal clear. Uh, it's, the question is, how long is it going to take? What's your timetable? I always tell people human rights work is not a, a sport for the short-winded. Uh, progress comes in decades. Martin Luther King Jr. once observed that the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. He wisely chose not to say how long it's going to take us to get there. Uh, I've worked for four decades in human rights, and even after seeing all that's happened in the world and reading this morning's headlines, I remain unbelievably optimistic about the future because I've seen how profoundly our world has changed. Robert mentioned that I wrote a book-length report in 1974 about Idi Amin in Uganda. He was committing unspeakable violations against his own people, and yet the world was paying almost no attention. There was no press coverage. It wasn't on the to-do list of governments. Today, Amin's outrages would be the subjects of dozens of human rights reports, YouTube documentation, UN Security Council meetings, uh, and war crimes investigations. The world doesn't always respond sufficiently, witness Syria today, but human rights issues are today squarely on the world's agenda. When I started, there were almost no human rights organizations operating locally in places like Uganda or Sub-Saharan Africa or in Asia or the Middle East or in Eastern Europe. Today, with the exception of North Korea and perhaps a few other places, there are human rights groups everywhere. In the 1970s, military dictatorships ruled Latin America from one end to another. White South Africans ruled apartheid by, uh, ruled South Africa by apartheid. The Soviet Empire was into its fifth decade, and Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland were locked in a violent and seemingly intractable conflict. Most gays were in the closet, and there was no such term as LGBT rights. On these issues and in these places, there was no end in sight. Yet things did change, and they changed profoundly. Conflicts still recur, there's violence, witness Ukraine today, but the world today looks nothing like it did 40 years ago, uh, and people all over the world see injustice and they say, why not us, why not justice, why not now for us? In the mid-1970s, most law students looked like me. They were white and male. They used to say, pale, male, and Yale. That, that was 20 years before Hillary Clinton declared that women's rights are human rights, and human rights are women's rights. It was 35 years before we had our first African-American president, and 40 years before the courts would uphold same-sex marriage. Measured in decades, these changes happen at astounding speed. And the history of the last 40 years happened because people like you entered the fray and they chipped away at problems that they were told were politically impossible to fix. There is no substitute. This is not a platitude, it's a fact. By virtue of your educations, the contacts you've made here, the doors that will be open to you now and in the future, you will have constant opportunities to make a difference. Consider what we're doing now at NYU on human rights and business. The premise is simple. In the modern economy, companies are increasingly important global actors. Collectively, their decisions have profound effects on human rights and human well-being. Today, half of the largest economies in the world are not states. They're private corporations. Walmart is the 30th largest economy in the world. Its annual revenues are roughly the equivalent of the GDP of Belgium or Taiwan. Multinational companies have been a major force for good, creating millions of jobs and lifting literally billions of people out of extreme poverty, but they often operate in places like Bangladesh, China, the Congo, or Nigeria, where local governments are not willing or often able to protect their own people. This is why we're working with companies in industry-specific human rights standards, uh, to whether it's manufacturing supply chains, in oil and mining, in agriculture, or on the internet. 
as lawyers in private firms working in-house with multinational corporations, or as global business leaders yourselves, you will confront these issues throughout your careers. What I ask you to do is to join us in shaping smart, practical human rights rules of the road uh, for the 21st century. Last point, I want to make a pitch for including government service somewhere in your careers. Appearances to the contrary, our political system is not permanently broken and government service is not dishonorable. Political participation and government service is the lifeblood of any democracy. If good people don't serve, we will not get the system we deserve. When I was offered the opportunity in 2009 to work for a rather special Yale Law graduate who was Secretary of State and her extraordinary legal advisor from Yale, I jumped at the chance. I saw up close how much difference a small group, a small but committed group of people can make in shaping policy. Now, I don't want to sugarcoat the experience. We fought many uphill battles within the government that we did not win, but Harold and I and others won far more than our share. And, so, and you can do the same. Perhaps now more than ever, our democracy depends on the best people, people like you, stepping up to serve. Congratulations and good luck in your careers. It's my pleasure now to invite you all to a champagne reception back in the courtyard of the Sterling Law Building. The proceedings are adjourned. Congratulations.